That leads us to biotechnology. Uh, the genome project itself, as I mentioned, was smoothly exponential, has remained exponential. Uh, the first genome cost a billion dollars. We're down now to about ten thousand dollars, headed for a thousand. Uh, National Institutes of Health is planning ultimately to collect a million genomes so that we can have this very elaborate database where studies can be done to relate genetic states to disease states. That'll be very powerful. They wouldn't do that if the genome still cost a billion dollars each, which is what the first one cost. Uh, the average price of two or three thousand, a million is only a few billion dollars, uh, and it's a feasible project. So again, greater price performance leads to new opportunities. And well, let me say a little bit more about biotechnology, and that we're not just learning about biology as an information process, we're learning to reprogram it. How long do you go without updating the software on your mobile device? This is probably doing that now as I speak. But uh, I'm walking around with outdated software in my body. That is not a metaphor or poetic sentiment. That is literally the case. Genes are little software programs. They're linear strings of data. They may not be written in C++. I think they're written in COBOL, actually. Uh, uh, not every audience gets that joke, because some people say, COBOL? What's COBOL? Um, they're actually written in three-dimensional proteins, which have uh, atomic interactions with each other, which we can now simulate. I remember having a debate about a decade ago that that would never be feasible. We'd never be able to simulate protein folding. And I said, no, we need about 10 to the 13th calculations per second in our supercomputers to simulate that. Uh, and indeed, we're now past that point. Supercomputers up to 10 to the 16th calculations per second. When we hit 10 to the 13th, indeed, we could simulate protein folding and protein interactions. Um, but these are little se linear sequences of data. And they, they evolved in uh, ancient times, conditions where uh, quite a bit different back then. Uh, I would like to tell my fat insulin receptor gene, you don't need to hold on to every calorie anymore. Uh, I'm confident the next hunting season will be good. <laughs> and uh, that was actually tried at the Jaws and Diabetes Center, because that is an outdated program. It underlies an epidemic of obesity. We just don't need to hold on to every calorie anymore. I mean, a thousand years ago, you worked all day to get a few calories, and there were no refrigerators, so you store them in the fat cells of your body. It was a good idea that biological evolution evolved. Uh, they turned off that gene in these animal experiments. These animals ate ravenously and remained slim, and they got the health benefits of being slim. It was not a fake slimness. They didn't get diabetes. They didn't get heart disease. They lived 20% longer. They got the health benefits of caloric restriction while doing the opposite, and they're working with a drug company to bring that idea to the human market. There are other genes we'd like to turn off that encourage or are required for atherosclerosis, the cause of heart attacks and strokes, uh, to continue to progress, uh, that cause the insulin, the lack of insulin sensitivity that underlies type 2 diabetes or that allow cancer to metastasize and so on. Uh, there are other genes we'd like to add that protect us. I'm uh, involved with a company where we take cells out of the body of patients who have a disease caused by a missing gene. So if you are missing this gene, uh, you have a very high likelihood of being diagnosed with this disease called pulmonary hypertension, which is a terminal disease. A life expectancy is about a year. And uh, so we take these lung cells out of the body, scrape them out of the throat, in, in vitro, in a petri dish, add this gene with, with some new techniques can then inspect that it got done correctly. The new gene is in place. We then replicate the cell several million times uh, exponentially. That is a, another new technology. Uh, now we have several million cells with your DNA, but with the gene that you're missing that causes this fatal disease, inject it back in the body, goes through the bloodstream. The body recognizes them as lung cells that get embedded in the lungs, and this is actually cured of this fatal disease in human patients and is undergoing continued human trials. 
Uh, so I've mentioned an example of turning off a gene, the fat insulin receptor gene, and adding a gene. Uh, there are, this is just two of hundreds of examples of doing that with many different genes to basically reprogram our genetic code. Uh, so we're not talking just about designer babies, we're talking about designer baby boomers, which uh, personally I'm much more interested in. Uh, and it's not just uh, reprogramming our genetic code, we're reprogramming what the individual cells in our body do. The whole area of stem cells is extremely exciting. Uh, we are now using three-dimensional printers to print out the, the scaffolding in a biodegradable manner of new organs like uh, livers and kidneys and lungs. This company that's doing the uh, gene replacement therapy is also uh, growing new lungs using three-dimensional printing and stem cell therapies. Uh, we've worked around, we, the scientific community, has worked around this issue with embryonic stem cells. Aside from the ethical issues that some ethicists have brought up, there's other problems with embryonic stem cells. There are very few of them, and it doesn't have your DNA. If you want a new kidney, you'd like it to have your DNA, not the DNA of some other embryo. We can now take your skin cells and reprogram. What's the difference between a skin cell and an embryonic stem cell? It has the same genes, right? Uh, the only difference is a certain genes that allow it to express itself as a pluripotent cell rather than a skin cell. And so scientists have discovered if you add four genes, which we can do easily, uh, to a skin cell, it turns it into the equivalent of an embryonic stem cell. Uh, except it has your DNA. And the ethicists who were opposed to embryonic stem cell research because it involves the destruction of embryos support this research because it doesn't involve the destruction of embryos. And anyway, it has your DNA and you have an inexhaustible supply of them. They're called induced pluripotent cells. They're now therapies that are actually reaching clinical practice, not officially approved yet in the FDA, uh, the status of our FDA and the balance of risk versus uh, reward that goes into drug approvals is something we could talk about for hours. But uh, if you go to Israel, for example, or some other countries, you can actually fix a broken heart from a heart attack. If, if someone's had a heart attack, they have a 50% chance of having damaged their heart. It's called a low ejection fraction. My father had a heart attack in 1961. It was a heart cripple. He could hardly walk around. He finally died of that condition in 1970. And it, was, it generally has been the case that you can't fix that. Your body will not rejuvenate heart muscle while it's beating. Uh, you can now actually fix that in a beating heart with stem cell therapies that are injected right into the heart. And I know people that were heart cripples and now have uh, basically rejuvenated uh, their heart to normal levels. Uh, and we are creating artificial organs like kidneys and livers. These have been done successfully in animals. Uh, so this is all on the sort of cutting edge. These technologies are in an early stage, but they're information technologies. And now that it's an information technology, rather than the hit or miss approach of the past, it's going to progress in this exponential manner. These technologies will be twice as powerful in a year a thousand times as powerful in 10 years, a million times as powerful in 20 years. And within a couple decades, uh, this, it will be a very different landscape in health and medicine as a result. Mm -hmm.